we wanted to go back a little bit. I mean, we talk salary cap things all the time and you know this team's been up against the cap by what was like 44 dollars at one point in time and it's it's such a different beast trying to run a team with a salary cap and you actually came in in the era that didn't have a salary cap it was uh it was the wild west you were free to sign whoever you wanted did you did you understand the difference but when that when that changed back in that 04 era and and what the repercussions of that were going to be at the time i I didn't because I was just a young guy coming up. One thing I noticed was the Leafs very rarely had young guys come in because they could just pay to bring in, uh, you know, veterans and and free agents because there was no cap. And at that point, Pat Quinn loved his um, veteran team. So when I made when I came on the scene, I was I was fortunate to, um, you know, come in uh, playing well, and Pat seemed to like me, and I was one of the the younger players that probably he ever probably coached that wasn't, you know, like a Pavel Burry or someone like that back in his day. But um, so I was a young guy and, and my first year we brought in like Joe Newendike came in, um, you know, we traded for Brian Leach at the deadline. It was, uh, it was quite the team uh, to, to, to be on. Um, I actually got to room with Joe Newendike my whole first year as a roommate. So it was, it was, it was crazy. And it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, and then from there, the lockout happened. So I missed a whole year. Actually, it was probably a good thing. I went and played in St. John's. But the year after the lockout, all of a sudden, our, our salary, our cap was was set at $39 million. So it was uh, a big cut from, from the team we had before. We lost Brian Leach because the year went by. And then you couldn't keep Roberts and, and Newendike. And um, so it changed quickly. And then that's when you saw teams starting to go young and figure out the whole cap system. Well, when I look at that roster, man, I mean, I'll go like it's going to take a while here, but Matt Sundin, Brian McCabe, Joe Newendike, Gary Roberts, Owen Nolan, Darcy Tucker, Nick Antropov, Thomas Cavalier, Robert Reichel, Alexander McGillney, Ponikarovsky, Matt Stage, and Michael Renberg, Brian Leach, Ron Francis, Ed Belfort. Like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, for a young guy to come into that organization and have that much veteran leadership around, like, how good was that for you to look around and, and see how, how guys operated in that league? Oh, it was, it was unbelievable. And, and not just like talking to them, like they kind of treated me like their little, little brother. And, and I was lucky <laughs> to stay around. It seemed like every time I was about to get sent down to St. John's, um, someone got hurt or it just kind of worked out where I stayed. So I, I only did end up getting sent down for a week. I didn't play any games, but I got sent down to St. John's at the trade deadline because we brought in Ron Francis and um, a couple other uh, veteran pieces um so it, it was cool i played a lot with owen nolan that year uh we had some chemistry um he unfortunately blew his knee out uh towards mcl late in the season so we missed him for the playoffs but it was honestly i sat in the room didn't say much but i just watched like that like you learn so much from watching um and i feel like the generation today the young guys come up they're pretty uh they they they're just younger and they've, they've always had everything at their fingertips and they come in thinking that, that they're going to get the whole world handed to them. Um, you know, so they're a lot more comfortable and, and it's a younger league. But when I came in, it was, I barely said a word. Um, but those guys took care of me, like Brian McCabe, Darcy Tucker, Ty Domi, all those guys, Matt's like, I couldn't ask for a better group and, and uh, uh, to learn from and, um, you know, kind of propelled my career to, to take on a leadership role as I played, you know, on, on some teams that went through some rebuilds and I was able to kind of be that guy that, um, you know, could help the young guys along. Yeah. Stage. I was going to say like, what the fuck are these guys watching now? Are they watching the, uh, the puck bunny in the third row? Cause they ain't watching the leadership core. Cause uh, they brought in O'Reilly. They brought in Shen. Nothing seems to work. They brought in Patty Marlowe, Joe Thornton. What's your assessment? Because uh, Jay and I have just had a, a meltdown today in the last couple shows because this team, like, Again, and maybe we're we're lucky to watch you guys play in the early uh, you know two thousands where it was just like hard nosed hockey. It was different hockey. But what's been your assessment of the Maple Leafs so far this year? Well, their their offense is elite. Like they're paying you know their top their whatever you guys call it the core four. Um, they're making a lot of money and they're elite. Like all those guys can put the puck in the net. But let's be honest to to win in the National Hockey League, you need four lines rolling um you need you need to ride some d um you need a horse back there that that's defensively sound that you know can shut down the other team's best and um i 
you look at, well, you just look at Edmonton, like they're kind of in the same boat, but you know, who did they bring in last year uh, at the deadline? It's made such a difference from Nashville um, at, home. Yeah. at home. And that made such a difference for, for them last year. And just a guy that could eat minutes and play against the other team's best players. Um, I don't really see the Leafs having it. They have players that can play, but they're also puck moving D. Um, and I just don't, you know, that, that who's really tough to play against on the Leafs back end. Like if you're Benoit. yeah, <laughs> like game in game out in a playoff series. So they have, they, they have to make some changes. And, and I think this little uh, streak where they keep blowing leads um, kind of, uh, brings light to that, and I think uh, I think Tree Living will, will have to exhaust uh, all options here. You mentioned uh, your era, obviously playing for Pat Quinn, and we've had a lot of conversations the last little while. And we we can just speculate. I mean, we're not in that room, we're not there with the head coach on a daily basis. But what kind of comfort level did it bring having a guy like Pat Quinn behind you guys? Well, Pat was he was just like uh, he was a, such a player's coach. Um, he was hard. He held guys accountable. Um, I'd say, you know, he, he just had your back and maybe his X's and O's and, and, and that stuff, the players kind of had to, um, do a lot of talking and, and figure that stuff out. Um, but he, he just had your back and, you know, made sure that you were going, he was a good motivator and he was a presence. Like, I think having a presence back there goes a long way and especially, you know, maybe more so in that era, cause you know, you, you look at that team, there's like seven or eight Hall of Famers. Um, you need to have a coach that that those guys respect. And even in today's game, uh, you know, if you have a coach that, that guys can respect and trust. and um, But that, that has to go through the locker room. You have to have players, your top players got to be respectful, but also have to be respected. Like that's a huge thing um, in a dressing room. And I think if you can bring it all together, you know, something special can happen and you see it. You know, something just clicked last year with Florida. Like, I think just it came together. They they just seem bonded. And, and we say it every year about the teams that have success. But it's honestly, the, the league is so tight. And and that's sometimes the difference is just that, that chemistry in the room and, and appreciation for each other. I'm sure you've played on some team stage where they changed the coach midseason. And, you know, you alluded to the fact that the players and, and the structure of the team probably isn't perfect. But... You know, we saw it with the Oilers going through problems. I think they liked Jay Woodcroft. They didn't want to unload him. But as soon as they did, a total culture change within the team. Um, have you seen that in your career where, I mean, I know you change a coach. It's a big change within a team. Do you think that could help the Maple Leafs? And what's your experience with that happening midseason? Actually, I, I've never played for a coach that got fired uh, midseason. Really? Surprisingly, I played a long time in a lot of teams that went through tough patches and rebuilds. Um, I've had multiple gms fired mid-season um which is also a pretty big deal but uh coach always off season lots of coaches but they always got on load in the off season but it's it is a change it's a change of philosophy um and you know it's it's just getting it's like a reset and, and it sucks to be a coach and i've done a little bit of coaching now since i retired but like in the league like you can't just make trades and and re reset things like a coach you know for the guys who are struggling it 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 brings in, you know, fresh life. And I've seen it from season to season where I struggled under Brent Sutter uh, at the end of his time here in Calgary. And we brought in Bob Hartley and, and it was like, you know, a fresh start and, and you kind of make the most of it um, as a player. And the same thing with the GM, it's a fresh start. You, 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 whenever there's a change as a player, you're like, yeah, I got a, I got a chance here to, to turn some, change some minds and, and, you know, fresh look at me. So um, I just think, you know, it, seems to work all the time when, when the coach gets changed, every, you know, Minnesota went on a heater when they changed their coach. Um, but I think that's, that's when you're an elite team, you know, that might change for a little bit, but you gotta, it, it, there's something more to it than just, you know, going on a 10 game win streak, you know, after coaching change, it's, it's what happens, you know, 20, 30 games in, um, you know, cause will you fall back into the place that you were? January 31st, uh, 2010. W what do you remember about that day? Of course, the big Dion Phaneuf trade. You got traded from Toronto to Calgary. What do you remember about that day? Uh, off day and Sunday in Toronto and, and just got a call um, at breakfast. You know, I was eating breakfast Sunday with, with my wife or my fiance at the time. And 
Uh, we had lost the night before to Vancouver. I remember that we lost in a shootout or an overtime or something. Um, yeah. And just got a phone call and be like, you got traded to Calgary and uh, you're not alone. We can't tell you who. And uh, five hours later, you're on an airplane to, to a new city, which, uh, which I still call home now. We love it here in Calgary. And um, yeah, it changes your life, but it was, it came out of nowhere to tell you the truth. I was becoming a, a UFA at the end of that year. So I knew, Maybe at the deadline, I'd get moved if if the, they didn't want to keep me. And I, I kind of knew like Tyler Bozak was coming on the scene. Grabowski was there. So I, I, I was having a really good season. So I was like, the way things are going, they're going to offload probably uh, any assets they have. Um, they did to Nick Antropov the year before too and, and traded him. So I was like, probably get traded. But I didn't expect it, you know, a month before the deadline. Um, so it was uh, it was a shock and and um i think anybody who's been traded mid-season would say the same thing it's a it's a life-changing experience to this day uh we still miss you in these parts stage uh but certainly i mean it, it's been fun to document what have you been up to uh, the last little while yeah so the last two seasons i i was coaching i was assistant coach with uh with the calgary hitman so the whl team out here and Really enjoyed it. Um, this year, though, I, I took a step back. It, it's it's a lot of travel. Coaching is a commitment, and uh, I got a five year old and an eight year old, and I want to make sure I'm um, around at, at these prime years of their life because uh, you only get so many of those years, and I want to coach them and help them. Uh, so I'm I'm just more part time this year with the Hitman. Um, I'm their skills skills and development coach is the the name tag they gave me. So. I don't have to travel with them, but I, I had to, to the saddle dome and practice with them when they're when they're home and head to home games when I can. So it's been nice. And yeah, I did a little bit of media through the through the COVID time and for the Flames games, I did some intermissions. So I've kind of dipped my toe everywhere and uh, just kind of feeling my way like like every uh, retired hockey player does. <laughs> Make sure to check out more of our content right here on the Leafs Nation YouTube page. We got long form interviews, we got clips, we got epic rants by Jay Rozo. We simply have it all. And don't forget, you can find out much more at theleafsnation.com. Thanks so much for watching.